Great to be with you again this morning. Um, it's funny, isn't it, that not everything that we do as Christians builds up the kingdom of God. Three pastors were having their regular pastors fraternal for a time of prayer and edification, mutual benefit and confession. One of them turned to the other two in the group and said, I really need to confess to you a, a sin I've been struggling with. And he said, I've got a drinking problem. Uh, last night I was down in the bar and I just went right the way through to a closing time and had to be peeled off the pavement and dragged back home. And the other two said, we're really glad that you were able to confess those sins to us and uh, maybe we'll be able to support you in your re rehabilitation over the course of these next few weeks. The other one said, actually, I, now we're in this kind of move, I feel like led to confess my sin as well. Um, my issue is gambling. I have found it so difficult to just walk past some of those places. I'm just spending everything that I've got on those slot machines, and I really need to confess my gambling addiction to you. And they said, well, God bless you. Well done for confessing those sins. We'll do what we can together to help you and support you in these next year. And the Anglican came to his turn, and he said, well, my brothers, thank you for sharing what you've just shared so accurately and authentically today. My real sin is I have an addiction to gossip, and I'm out of here. <laughs> Not everything that we do when we get together as Christians will build the kingdom of God. I want us to be thinking today about how do we build and reinvent and rethink churches for rural and wider, more regional ministries. It's a crucial question. It's not a new question. It's a question, as we were just doing the geographic comparisons, that the travel times that it takes to work out a sphere of ministry and the amount of the distance and time it takes to do ministry is one incredibly important feature of understanding how to serve God and extend his kingdom, not just the amount of people. Some of us are living and working in local areas and parishes that we number in hundreds of meters. Others, it's thousands of kilometers. And yet we all have this calling and this need to rethink and to reimagine. And often it feels that the wider the sphere of our calling, the, the less the resources in terms of people and money and support, and we feel like we have the biggest job possible with the least amount um, of opportunity to do it. The last two churches that I have been called to lead have been in a context of physical ruins. The inner city church was partly ruined. I took over as the vicar. The churchyard was the main drug dealing area for the neighborhood. Um, the council car park was next door. They'd cut through the gates, and it was where they shot up. There were needles everywhere. And one of my first jobs was to go to where there was an outdoor Victorian toilet that had broken down and to demolish it with a sledgehammer before my second church council meeting, which I did. We turned that round from a drug-infested, needle-infected site and turned it into a place where children could play safely. The current church that I'm now trying to build is formed physically on a derelict site that has been uninhabited since 1991. No running water, no services, no sewage, no electricity, no gas. We've had to take apart some of what was there before we could rebuild it. Toxic asbestos, ruined chicken sheds, and start to transform them. The pig pens are now a Sunday school. The seed barn is now a chapel. The garage for the agricultural equipment is now the church office and kitchen. And the plum harvest store is now a retreat space. Reinventing the church for regional mission is no easy feat. And we sometimes have to remember those words from Jeremiah chapter 1. We have to uproot and tear down before we can plant. We have to demolish and overthrow before we can build. The generation we meet in Haggai had priorities and goals which had slipped from their high-minded ideals of previous years and perhaps despair had set in. It's quite easy to feel like you've been handed a job or a role that is hard to accomplish, that maybe the people before you had better resources available to meet the challenge. And it's quite easy to become discouraged and exhausted when facing the tasks in front of us. And into that context, God spoke 
and called them afresh to a task that had once inspired them when they were younger and perhaps their, their, their ancestors and those that they think they come after. Before rebuilding could go ahead, rubbish needed clearing. The temple that Haggai was charged with motivating his generation to rebuild was actually a ruin. Rubbish and rubble filled the place. Stones were shattered, walls were tumbled in, wooden gates decayed, precious fixtures and fittings nowhere to be found. Despite the fact that the ancient site was filled with rubble, some of the enormous stones could be reused and repurposed and worked into the fabric of a new structure. After checking, Haggai and his contemporaries realized some of them were solid and usable. They would be hugely valuable. Now, people who rebuild for the next generation often find this. Large segments of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome are made from the dressed stones of the Colosseum. Reused by Italian builders hundreds of years after the Roman genius had constructed and completed the stadium of the Colosseum. It's the same reason that reclamation yards are being filled with hipsters looking to repurpose all of those Victorian heating elements and putting them back into their house, the cast iron radiators and the Roman and Victorian bricks. When we are reinventing and reimagining, we don't need to start from scratch in every generation. We've got the immovable rock and foundation of our faith who is Christ himself, upon which all Christian thought depends. We've got those stones of scripture, reliable and tested and trustworthy. We have firm and dependable Christian creeds and doctrines and great confessions of the faith. Though there may be much rubbish that needs to be cleared away as we own the histories of our past, our churches, the missions perhaps, the mission stations of the past, but inst amongst the rubble and the rubbish, there will be some stones of value. The author and playwright Dorothy L. Sayers provocatively wrote, we're constantly assured that the churches are empty because preachers insist upon too much doctrine and dull dogma, as people call it. The fact is the precise opposite. It's the neglect of dogma that leads to dullness. The Christian faith is the most exciting drama that ever staggered the imagination of man. And the dogma is the drama. The dogma is summarized quite clearly in the creeds of the church. And if we think it is dull, it is because we have either never really read those amazing documents or we've recited them so often and so mechanically that they've lost all sense of their meaning. The burden that many of us may feel. How are we going to be obedient to reimagining church that we're called to reach and serve a generation, but also those who are yet to come and those who are emerging now? What we are called to build should be enjoyed by others and often those coming after us. The rising generation, the missing generation, the generation we thought would be into sex, drugs and rock and roll are instead plagued by celebrity mania, identity crisis and an urge to end their lives. We live in sobering times, whether it's in New South Wales or in Old South Wales. In that Old South Wales town of Bridgeton, the journalist Bryony Gordon wrote of an incident that came across a few years ago. In the last year, she wrote, Bridgend has been stunned by the suicides of seven of its young people. Yesterday morning, every person in the Aroma Cafe was poring over a newspaper, absorbing details of the latest tragedy. A 17-year-old Natasha Randall, or Tasha as she was known, hanged herself in her bedroom a week today as her father, Kel Kevin, and her stepmother, Katrina, busy themselves downstairs. Her smiling face beams out from the newspaper pages and she makes a mock gangster gesture with her hands. Behind her, her good friend Liam Clark does the same. Liam, 20, is now also dead. He hanged himself on Boxing Day. One girl said outside the college, suicide is just what people do here because there's nothing else to do. Then there was 17-year-old Katie hanging around the Knowlton Arcade in her lunch break from a business court course. She told me about a friend's father he jumped off a bridge last year. She said, it's becoming a bit of an everyday thing. When the first one happened, I was shocked. But now it just seems normal, fashionable almost. I don't know. Perhaps it's the time of year, isn't it? How can this be, she wrote, the journalist. How can this be? Why did so many of these youngsters feel so desperate that taking their own lives was the only option? The journalist left that question hanging. No real explanation seemed to cut it for her. The fact of the matter is, 
across regions, rural areas, and even in our urban situations as well. There is an entire generation in ruins. It's not just the infrastructure or the institution of the church. We have a generation in ruins, in mental ruins, in spiritual and emotional ruins. And the call of the people of God is to rebuild people and communities, not just church buildings. An evangelistic organization called Innovista found that 96% of church leaders felt that increasing the number of 16 to 13 year olds in their churches is either more important or as important as every other top priority. But when they were asked, only 11% felt that they were well resourced to do this in terms of people and training and tools. In the UK yesterday, a new social attitude survey was released. Newspapers love a headline and to create a crisis. One paper, The Guardian, led with this. The Church of England is facing a generational catastrophe. Only 2% of young adults identify with it at all. 7 out of 10 young adults say they have no religion whatsoever. The true reflection is, of course, a lot more complex. But there's no denying that younger adults, as a proportion, are drifting further and further away from a living faith in Christ. It doesn't mean, though, that they are actively opposed. Other research is indicating that in the UK, they're actually more tolerant of Christianity than those who are older. They just don't know what it is. It's undeniably been the case for us at Oxford as we've been involved in more and more university evangelism. A greater enthusiasm to engage with the ideas of Christianity than we have ever known or encountered in our ministry in the last 20 years. And yet, almost no understanding of what Christianity is. It's gone from being something that was rejected into something which is totally unknown, and therefore, it's becoming exotic again. And students love something interesting and exotic. We're finding young people find out something on Monday and Tuesday, investigate further in conversations Wednesday and Thursday, and giving their lives to Jesus on Friday. Time and time again, in our university evangelism, and this, we're seeing people come to know the Lord in two waves in a single week. In the first two days are those friends who've been brought along to Christian events by their friends, the ones who know a Christian. Thursday and Friday, those people start to make commitments or decide to go on a follow-up course who knew no Christians at all in their university, had no Christian background, and had literally become intrigued in two to three days of conversations and discussions. And then many of them make commitments by Friday as they pray and ask Jesus into their lives. So even as we're recognizing this huge challenge that faces the regional church, that faces the local church, but of, of an entire generation in ruins, that when we're asking this question about how to reinvent the church, we've got to be thinking about the future and future people and the present people we've got who are just not on church councils, but they are full members of the body of Christ. And we've got to be thinking about how to serve them and how to lead them as well. As I said, I currently run a church on a farm on the outskirts of London. It's a historic plum and cherry farm. Fruit farmers know that you have any fruit farmers here or people who grew up in a kind of a fruit farm? Anyone? Just me? No, nope, one other. Thank you very much. Well, let me tell you a little bit that I've learned about fruit farming, having now got a fruit farm, which I didn't know anything about before. One of the things you do is you take a root stock, and then depending on the type of fruit that you're aiming for, you graft in the fruit stock into the root stock. The historic farm that we've got took wild cherries, often from a Romanian rootstock, and grafted in a classic Victoria plum English fruitstock into the top of them. In the 1700s, the farm that we're currently on was the greatest plum providing and fruit farm um, with the biggest crop for the whole of London. They would pick early in the morning at 5 a.m. and it would be on the breakfast tables of the London gentry uh, by 8 as they went along the 20-mile road to get there. Anglicanism has a rootstock which is both Celtic and Roman. 
And that rootstock was transplanted to Australia where new fruit was required and new fruit has been grafted in over this last 150 years. Now the Celtic models of church and of mission lead to and have always led to different forms of church planting and different forms of ministry. Roman Britain had Roman Christianity and even martyrs such as Alban in the third century. But travel to the Cornish coast down on the west and you'll see evidences of the Celtic model. And to Lichfield, the Celtic, down to Canterbury, the Roman. Perhaps St. Regulus, he came from Greece with some relics to plant a Christian community in a Pictish settlement of a place we now know as St. Andrews on the east coast of Scotland. Celtic church planting was an initiative, a form of missionary monasticism. Many travelling by boat from Ireland to the western coasts of England, establishing small and vibrant Christian communities, often in sparse and self-denying contexts. The tip of Cornwall is still littered with the names of all of these early church planters. Every town is named after the church planter who planted a congregation there in the tip of West Cornwall. A young girl called Aya and the town of St. Ives. A Christian missionary called Sunan, who planted a church in 520 AD. You can see the small chapels on promontories and coastal plains as they eked out an existence in prayer and worship and small agriculture and evangelism. Very little centralised control, a huge dose of heroism as these pioneers were just catapulted across the seas and told to start a Christian community in the middle of nowhere. You can see this in the tips of Wales, the tips of Cornwall, Ireland sending missionaries to Scotland and the Isles. Iona planted by Columba in 563, Aidan planting Lindisfarne in 635. All these missionaries needed was tolerance and a small welcome of a landowner, even to settle a tiny patch of ground that nobody else wanted, and that's where they began. The Roman model was planted through the likes of Augustine of Canterbury, chosen by Pope Gregory to evangelize the English in 595, much more structured, a closer relationship with kings and queens and rulers. Patronage was sought, an established form that was top down. It brought organization to religious life. Now these monasteries, now mostly ruined, are still visible in Canterbury and even in St. Andrews. So this blend exists within Anglicanism of Celtic and Roman missionary spirituality and of understanding of church. The parish system developed out of this. The local parish system in the English church can be dated from as late as the 1100s. I know that sounds a bit ridiculous, but imagine that seven to eight hundred years after the, the churches had been planted, the parishes took that long to develop. It was actually external economic demands to do with tithes and taxes that brought about this change as local rulers wanted to tax the Christian communities. They broke them into local parishes, not the churches themselves. Jones, in her book, A Thousand Years of the English Parish, said, the parish implies two things, spiritual care of a group of people and a territory with definite boundaries. The territorial pattern of English parishes emerged gradually and was substantially in place by the end of the 12th century. In the early phase of life, the churches in England, the parish was much more like the diocese, expanding over entire counties and kingdoms. They were regional concepts, not local ones. So those of you who are running regional parishes with a large space, you have the earlier model of the parish. That is, the original concept of the parish are those vast territories, some of them extending over national borders between kings and areas and whole different communities. That is the heart of what a parish was. It had the role more like a diocese. Pounds concludes the Anglo-Saxon minster then became a centre for missionary activity. The primary purpose of the major churches was for English was for Christian mission and consolidating that with pastoral care. But the way that this happened has always been incredibly varied. In rural and more remote and inland areas, the geographic scope of a parish can vary enormously. And the role of individual Christians and church communities will also be varied 
We need to build differently for different contexts. As we said, some parishes are measured in miles and some in meters. Some parishes are regions in themselves, others are neighborhoods. But it has always been this way. It has always been this way. So I want to revisit how, in these regional contexts, the early church and the Saxon church and the churches through some of the ages tried to respond to the missional mandate when you had a wider region to go for than one that you could just walk to or get a small tram ride from one side to the other. Minsters, which were these missionary monastic hubs with a patch of land around them, they were the first churches to have the word parish ascribed to them. Parochiae was a way of describing the sphere of influence, the sphere of ministry of a missionary hub, rather than a way of describing the effect of a local church. Now, inevitably, some kind of territorial consolidation happened. There was a limit to how long you could travel from one side to the other, and there was a kind of a practical limit as to how far that went. But in England, and particularly as the years went on and some of these monasteries became more and more substantial, sometimes they would cross country borders. Just outside Oxford, and a place called Whitney, another place called Burford, those churches there were run from France and were were offshoots of missionary minsters from northern France and were not under the oversight or the control of the bishops at all. And they're still there now, one on the outside of the city and the parish church in the middle. The two of them cooperating with different forms of ministry side by side. It has always been this way. And they've always required rethinking and reimagining in each generation. You may be surprised to hear this quote from 1882. The church, the General Synod, in those days it was called the General Congress in England, used to meet and would have official reports a bit like a synod report. One of the official reports that came out in 1882, there were a number about the world mission, a number about to, with all sorts of issues that were coming up. One of them was to do with the extraordinary growth of the Salvation Army that had been planting Christian communities all over the UK and was growing, the fastest growing church movement in the UK at the time was the Salvation Army. And the Anglicans, a hundred years after trying to get their head around Methodism and not having learned the lessons particularly well, tried to learn the lessons better from the rise of the Salvation Army as they had from the rise of uh, Methodism. One of the ways they did it was that they formed the church army. If you can't beat them, join them. So they decided that they were going to start the church army as a, as a comparison, as a way of saying, if you want to do that kind of Christianity, you don't have to leave the Anglican church. We've got our own here. You don't have to join the Salvation Army. That was one of the reasons why it came out. But also because they were wanting to find a way to resource and support evangelists and missionaries, but do it in such a way that it could still work within the parish and the diocesan structures that they already had a commitment to and the church army emerged. One of the groups that was behind it was our own, the own church that I was part of as a student, St. Aldate's in Oxford, was one of the contributing churches to the rise of the church army. But listen to this quote from 1882. We've been forced at last to see clearly what we have long guessed, that pastoral, parochial, and edificatory theory of Christian work, though good, is one-sided. Before the Reformation, this theory is corrected by the widespread of such bodies as the preaching friars. But since that time, the parochial theory has had exclusive possession of the church, and we can now see the disastrous extent of the failure. The parochial theory lacks the spirit of aggression, and wherever Christianity ceases to be aggressive, there Christianity recedes. The result of 300 years of reformed Christianity, which ought to be the most potent, is that we find ourselves in the midst of what has been called heathen England, and we must carry on the work of conversion side by side with the work of edifying, with no jealousy between the two departments. What they mean is not aggression in terms of like bashing people, literal Bible bashing, but that kind of, of zeal, of heart, where you're prepared to lay your lifetime for a person and a cause that is worth sacrificing for. That kind of deep zeal and commitment to seeing if it kills me, 
I still want to see the kingdom of God established in this neighborhood. We have been hedging our bets. We have been going for a low-risk, low-return understanding of ministry. The parable of the tenants makes it very clear. The parable of the talents, I mean, makes it very, very clear. We're not meant to bury what we have. The resources that have been entrusted to us, maybe a church building, maybe a congregation of people, maybe the intellectual resources or the people that have invested in us in the past, the intellectual capital in our education, what are we doing with it? With our, in our intellectual capital, our spiritual capital, our emotional capital, the physical capital, the buildings, the territory, the places, what are we doing with it? Have we risked it in order to get a return? Or have we buried what we have into the ground? Are we prepared to risk it in order to grow it? Each generation has fundamentally asked these questions to try to reach their generation. So there is a ruin. There is a crisis. In Australia, according to the National Church Life Survey, between 1950 and 2007, monthly church attendance declined from 44% to 17%, although it's now slowed and it's now down to just 16% and it's probably different today. All statistics carry with them all sorts of other things. I'm not going to uh, quote that, but at the very least, you're saying there's one third that there was in 1950. Now, you may not think losing two thirds is a crisis or a ruin, but other people might. <laughs> if you'd lost two thirds of your house, you might think you had an issue. Your husband or your wife or your children might bemoan the fact that they no longer have a bathroom that they used to have before. They might think that that's an issue. Somehow we haven't realized or recognized the depth of the problem that we are facing and the real ruins and the real crisis that we have. Some people think in Haggai's temple, there were one third of the stones still remaining and two thirds destroyed, scattered and burned. So that context of the ruined temple needing to rebuild it for the next generation is very similar to the ones that we face. Many churches have grown through this process of pioneers and settlers. But once we've settled, the structures gather around that settling and then they're there to sort of maintain but not to grow. But what happens when it starts to shrink again? How do you then respond if you've got a generation of leaders who are used to knowing how to run a settlement when they have to learn how to become pioneers again? One of the places I got the chance to visit in the last few years as a church has been supporting ministry in northern Uganda. And in northern Uganda, in a place called Karamoja, it's just north of one of those pictures of Kitgum, which you saw there. Two tribes were coming down from Ethiopia many, many years ago. As they came down, they settled in the region. These two tribes are known as the Karamojong and the Ateso. They'd left their homeland in a time of drought to discover new land and discover new pastures. And when they got down to the place which is now northern Uganda, one younger group wanted to keep going. They said, this isn't really what we came all of this way to find. There's got to be somewhere further where we get a coast again, or whether we get some, some water or somewhere we can grow our vegetables, not just look after our flocks. But they couldn't really agree, so half of them went further, and half of them stayed and settled where they were. And the tribe ended up splitting into two tribes. The names today reflect that split. The Ateso is translated to mean the rebellious ones who carried on going. And the Karamajong is translated as the old ones who will go no further. <laughs> they became defined by each other's slagging off names that they'd given to each other. So the Ateso then took that on themselves. They are called the rebellious young ones. And then the old, t the old farts, essentially, who would go no further as the other guys. That's their names. Those are their identities now, and they kind of wrestle with them and that effect. They were saying, we just don't have any more energy left for pioneering and change. These old ones can go no further. <laughs> but the young ones are often accused as being rebellious when all they're trying to do is keep going 
because they feel they haven't got to where they need to get to in order to pass things on to the generation coming after them. The settlers and the pioneers have to be able to live together, particularly in the situation where the settlements and the mission is needing to pioneer again. We need to find a way in this middle space to allow really good relationship and cooperation between the pioneers and the settlers, between the Celts and the Romans, between the missionaries and those who are running pastoral ministry, and to say all of those have a validity within the kingdom of God. None of them is better, though. And we need to find a way of releasing honor and resources and energy and people to allow both of those things to happen all at the same time. And nowhere is that more important than these wider regional areas that feel like they have so few resources and so few people resources to do such a massive job. As we thought this through, we felt that we wanted to revisit the Minster model as a church and as a community and as a couple. We became convinced, along with many other theologians, that we had to, that the conditions had arisen that were going to require a few more minsters in these areas. And nobody else had really done it at the time for about 500 years. We thought, okay, we'll give it a go anyway. What could possibly go wrong? And so we, as we prayed, we saw really in our, in our, in our spirits, in our minds, that we really want to be halfway between Oxford and London, right by the Ring Road. And we were going to start a Minster community in that place. The single-digit percentages of young people that had given rise to the original Minsters in 600 AD, we had reached that point again, and we needed to revisit those missionary models to try all over again. The Minster we felt to plant, halfway between Oxford and London by a major transport route, would be focused on the next generations, would have a close relationship with the land. You wouldn't have to be an environmentalist or a Christian. We were going to bring those two things together. In other words, it would be a holistic, a non-specialist centre, a new monastic community with a missionary mandate. The bishops of Buckingham and Oxford invited us to plant this community. We really were not sure how this would emerge or develop. We had no financial support at all from any central agency, either from the diocese that I'd come from, nor to the one that I was going to. I became a non-stipendary minister. I was given PTO, permission to officiate, and after two years, we received a bishop's mission order. We're reviewing that after five years, and it's probably going to become permanent, or they might create, we might create a micro-parish of 70 acres. It's been very challenging. We have to continue to see people come to Christ. We installed an outdoor baptistry, also known as a pond, in the plum orchard, and we baptize people there every summer. We planted this church by starting in a rented home. In theological terms, that's building from the oikos first, the Christian household. And from the home, we then rented a, church, uh, a school on a Sunday morning, and then we bought the 70-acre derelict farm on the outskirts of the city, halfway between Oxford and London. As we did so, we realized we needed also, in order to be a missionary community for the next generation, we needed to have a DNA, a way of operating that was going to work for them and was going to connect with them and those generations coming afterwards, not just what we enjoyed ourselves. The next generation have a, a different appreciation of brands. They receive information in different ways. In the 1950s, before church collapsed, this is how we used to do it. Broadcast TV, radio, newspapers, billboards, and people were the passive recipients. Within the churches, the church leaders and others would tell them what they needed to know. Nowadays, it's completely the other way around. We are in the middle of our communication universe. We pull down. And the young adults, even more so, are in the center of their communication universe. They will take information and influence wherever the heck they want to get it from. And if you're a church leader, you really have no say whatsoever or where people are getting their information from. So how do we begin to, to grow within this almost like a sea of influence instead of a structure? Now, marketing people have put more money into this question than churches do, by and large. And we started doing some research on this in about 2010, and we discovered as we were looking for some research within the churches and within the academic community, there was nothing out there at all about how to reach and engage with millennials and iGen, NetGen, the young adults that were coming through at the time. All of it was proprietary. It had all been paid for by big brands like Cadbury's or Chanel or BMW. Now, one of our cousins worked for those advertising agencies and gave us all of that, as long as we weren't allowed to make money out of it, we were allowed to keep it embargoed for a bit, 
And one of the things they looked at was what made the magic circle of brands that everybody wanted to be in that magic circle of brands. Here are some of them that you've heard of. Apple, Sony, Google. Don't know if you've got Innocent Smoothie, but YouTube was some of them. And they said to become part of this magic circle of brands, you need to be trusted, agile, transparent, and engaging. That's all that young adults wanted in their perfect brands. And Amy and I thought to ourselves, hey, that's great. That's what I'd like in church as well. <laughs> I'd like to be part of a community that is trustworthy and agile and transparent and engaging. But too many of us and too many of our churches have become untrustworthy and stuck, secretive, obscure, or boring. In fact, the absolute opposite of what the magic brands are. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to just think about Christianity in terms of a brand, but it's like a, a temperature take on what seems to connect and what doesn't. We also take another analogy that the young adults have been using a lot, which is to do with the computer analogy. Hardware, operating systems, and software. Just for those of you who, I'll just give you a little rethink on that. Hardware is a question like, what are you working with? Is, is, it, is it a desktop? Is it a tablet? Um, what's its, its, its RAM? How many, you know, how, what's its memory? These kinds of kind of core questions. How big is it? You know, those questions. On the other end, you've got software and you've got apps. The, the kind of point of delivery, the things that you actually work with as a consumer. The crucial question has become not how big is your computer or how whizzy is your Microsoft Word. The real question is how good is your operating system? And young adults, and, and many of us, have become very acclimatized to our operating system. We then end up not really caring whether it's big or small. We don't care if we're working with pages or Word. The question is, once we're in an operating system universe, iOS, Windows, Linux, Android, we, we can then move from one to the other very, very easily because we're in the same operating system. What we began to discover as we talked with young adults in our church, and particularly those who were coming to Christ, is that they wanting to be inside a Christian operating system. They didn't mind if their church was big or small. They preferred big, but they were happy to do authentic, smaller community as long as they could be part of a monster festival in the summer. They could get their big fix. But they didn't want to do things in a stuck-in-the-mud kind of way. One of the reasons I had a great little moment for this, back in the early days when Facebook had just begun and before young adults had abandoned it for Snapchat. In those early days, I was under pressure as a new vicar in my church to increase the electoral roll. That's, for us, a members list. And we were going to be taxed by the diocese for the size of this members list. And so I wasn't really that bothered that it only had 50 people on it at the time. So I managed to kind of broker a deal that I said, okay, well, I'll just pay a fixed rate regardless of how many people are in my electoral roll. But then I tried to get members of my young adults in my church to be on the electoral roll, and I couldn't do it for love nor money. I asked them to be on the church council, and they said, no way, not under any circumstances. I had to convince people and say, you can be on the church council, but you can send your apologies every time. And that was the only way I could get any of the young adults into the church council in my church. I then decided to set up a Facebook group for our church. Within one week, it had 200 members on it. The young adults were showing their belonging and membership in different ways. They were volunteering. They were giving of their time and their money and their effort. Some of them were involved in ministries four days of the week. But they didn't want to be on the church council. They were just going to turn up and rock up and change the world, change the community. But they weren't interested in votings or synods or any of that kind of stuff. As far as they were concerned, you can take it, burn it. It means nothing to me. That's an operating system question. It's not saying they don't want to be members. It's not saying they don't want to engage. In fact, they were the most engaged members of my community. They just didn't like the operating system. And what it became clear to me is that, that the Bible was not demanding an operating system of synodical government. And in fact, neither were our ordination vows. I'm an Anglican. It wasn't in the ordinal. I wasn't promising to stand up to everything in those kinds of ways. They've always been adapted. They've always been revisited and renewed and looked at again. Are they serving their purpose? Does canon law do what it's meant to do, support the ministry of the people of God and support and encourage and strengthen the churches, not just make it another hurdle that needs to be jumped over? 
this analogy of computers became really important to us. So as we planted our new community, we said, we want to try to be trusted and agile. We also want to, to begin to learn what operating system is going to work for us as a missionary-minded, young, adult-focused, rural church community. All of these different things that were part of it. I'll move on from that. And this is where we are now. This is our church building. I know it looks to you like it is a tent at a big top in the middle of a farm. There's a reason why it looks like that. <laughs> That's because that is what it is. In the early days, I had no office. I hosted apologetics in the pub one evening a week at the same table, table 10 at 8 p.m. You could come if you liked to. If you didn't want to, you didn't need to. It was the best ale in Buckinghamshire. And I said, come if you want, don't come if you don't want. The, the, the beer is amazing and the food is great. I'd be perfectly happy there on my own. Often, 25 people would come. They would bring their friends from their workplace with no agenda and they would say, we've got this vicar. He'll just answer any questions you've got about life, the universe, spirituality. If people had a pastoral um, issue that they needed to deal with because I had no office and we had no infrastructure, they would meet me at table 10. Instead of at 8, they would meet me at 7, join me for some food, some fish and chips, and then we would... We would talk together afterwards. We had guests regularly into our home. Our church service started in our home. On a Sunday, we would invite every single person who came to our house to stay for lunch. We began to build out of the home instead of out of the church building that we didn't have and we still actually don't have. We formed missional communities. One young adult group now of those missional communities now has 60 members in it and breaks down into, 60, into six different small groups, all with our own leaders. These missional communities now organize their own social events and outreaches and weekends away and mission trips and food and hospitality. They completely run themselves. In the first eight weeks of us starting this new missionary community, 16 young adults came to faith or came back to faith after having abandoned church 10 years earlier. We got great coffee. We had Wi-Fi before we had walls. We met in cafes and homes and pubs and a school for two years and then we bought this farm. We restored the farm together as a community, making and repairing the walls of the barns. We opened our first carol service. And we had 180 people on our first day. One lady came to Jesus on our first service on the farm. We were only 60 core members at the time. The next 18 months, we grew again. Outgrew our barns and bought a tent online at gospeltent.com. And we had it delivered. I said to myself, I also want a donkey. I tried to, to borrow a donkey from a local farmer as I had none. And he, I said, I want it for four weeks. I want to do four weeks of evangelistic services with live donkeys in my church. And the farmer said, no, you can't have a donkey for four weeks. I said, can I just rent it for four weeks? He said, no. So I went onto line and I went to mikesdonkeys.com. And I bought myself an online donkey, delivery included. And, and uh, Molly arrived. And then she was a bit lonely, so I had to bring her four sheep and because um, she was braying all the way through the nights and that and then other people heard that we had a great kind of donkey thing going on and gave me two other donkeys so now we have three donkeys and 30 sheep we had 40 pigs at one stage but that's another story we had five guard geese or six guard geese who attacked everybody like they'd done in the roman forum they were also quite good for us as well and we've got chickens and we've also set up an apiary as well this is our christmas service and you can see the sheep that's actually inside the church service um, at Christmas Eve. We began to work out how do we do mission and ministry in a regional space and how do we use the fact that we're in the land? How do we use the fact that we're in a rural context and become a tool for mission and a tool for ministry? How does this become our greatest asset, our greatest resource? Instead of it being a problem, how can it become a benefit? How do we embrace this absolutely wholeheartedly and be the best rural church hub we can possibly be? So we restored our barns and we turned them into places of worship and prayer. We built a tent. And it's amazing how easy it is to grow the kingdom of God when you're not so worried about infrastructure. We turned the land and the blossoms and the fruit to our own advantage, hosting big free events on our community farm for members of the public based around the seasons. At spring, we have a free lambing day where everybody comes. We had 400 people come to that. On bonfire night, we have a massive free bonfire. We have summer festivals, exciting Christmases with stable animals inside our tent. 
In the summer, we take off all of the sides. We've got prayer spaces for 24-7 prayer in a small hut under an apple tree. We host retreats and prayer. We even have professional psychologists meeting with their private clients on our land. We've supported and combined with mission and church planting partnerships and projects in Uganda and Nigeria and Windsor and Ascot, slightly different, and West London and north of Birmingham in Warsaw. We're joining with 11 other churches in November of this year. Since we've arrived and we've grown as a community, there's several hundred in our congregation now. And we have worked with the other local churches and the other local parishes across four different denominations. We have 11 churches joining in a combined mission to all of our schools using apologetics that's going to be going on for a week in November as a result. We started more and more missional communities, more missional households within striking distance and much further afield. And we as a Christian community are trying to be a minster are learning how to support other missionary-minded individuals where there's a DNA match, not necessarily where they're close to us. In fact, it's almost easier to do it when they're slightly further afield. The top picture there is the church in Walsall, which I am now the vicar of, and it's two hours' drive away from where our church is. The tent on the right is another tent mission um, of a private individual who'd been working with us who's like, I can do this as well. And it's this tent idea has particularly caught on. A school's mission in the tough area of the inner city. A church that has been planted in the middle of a youth centre in Windsor called the Windsor Fellowship Church. And just this year, in northern Nigeria, in Jos, another Minster church using a tent being commissioned by the Archbishop Benjamin Koshi here. And he named it the Trinity Minster because he'd been so inspired and the others who come and trained with us felt that this was really going to help them reach the rural area in northern Nigeria and around Jos. This Minster idea was going to be so important for them. And so that is Trinity Minster in Jos being commissioned this Easter time. That leaves us with four types of resource churches for us to begin to get our heads around, some of which you may be familiar with. City centre resource churches. These are the ones that have been particularly picked up by Holy Trinity Brompton in recent years and working with bishops and dioceses. Gas Street in Birmingham, St Peter's in Brighton. In previous eras, cathedrals may have done this kind of job. In certain dioceses, one or two cathedrals still do so. These incubate teams and leaders for new church plants, make, work closely with the diocese and the bishop to make this happen. These are now, in the last four to five years, being funded by the diocese but resourced in terms of personnel and branding by Holy Trinity Brompton and church planting networks. Many of the ordinands I've raised up are now leading those resource churches. Regional resource churches, those tend to be large parish churches or in the center of a larger rural area, which also house networks, renewal networks like New Wine Network, others who help training days in children's ministry or prayer ministry training days, worship leader training days, alpha training days, and they host network leaders once a month. That's the kind of thing that many rural churches are doing to encourage and strengthen others. Specialist resource churches. London Diocese has designated four churches as youth minsters. We're working with three of those now as a minster church. Others host campuses for theological training and theology colleges, um, in, particularly in the more rural areas, such as Miletus. And then a church like ours, which is a minster tending to support and resource missionaries and evangelists and church planters and mission initiatives and missional communities along relational lines and contacts, which have collected along shared values and shared relationships over a much wider geographic area. We're becoming hubs for missionary networks and agencies and organization, and in our case, learning how to do this by reintroducing nature and agriculture, the appreciation of space and beauty and fullness into our overly digitized lives. We're also supporting and working with other minsters to allow them to emerge and flourish. These are some of the more Celtic opportunities. So I just want to call out to you guys, really, and can we stand and pray together? I know in this session, a little bit more theoretical, a bit more geeky, and yesterday, a little bit more stories. I think as we stand here, thinking of a passage like Haggai. I don't know what your situation of ruin is, whether you feel you don't have the resources or the energy, whether you feel like a Karamajong or an Ateso today, whether you feel like an old one who can go no further, 
or a young and rebellious one, or whatever other people say about you, in the presence of God, that's an irrelevance for a second. You are here as the people of God with a calling to extend the kingdom of God wherever he has placed you and to do it with all of your heart and soul and your mind and your strength, to love God and to love your neighbour and to see the kingdom of God extend, to see something new planted where there's just brambles, to see new things built where there are just ruins. If this is something that you've come away once every three years to get away, to be re-envisioned and reinvigorated, as I said yesterday, we need the Spirit of God to equip us and fire up our imaginations and give us the energy we need and the courage we need because the job is flipping tough and it may only get tougher. As Paul says, I've got this energy, it's his energy working through me. If that's something that you feel like you need today, extra courage, extra energy, resources from heaven or resources from earth. Why don't we just bring ourselves before God in prayer right now and ask him for what we need to extend his kingdom in our urban or rural settings, wherever God has placed us. Holy Spirit, you are the one who sent to the church to grow the kingdom of God. We ask that you would refresh us as we're standing here today. May your word come alive in our hearts. May your call become clearer and clearer as we look to the future. Lord, if we feel like we are running out of energy and can go no further, would you restore and strengthen our energy, strengthen our resolve, strengthen our vision and give us courage for this next season. And Lord, we pray for the next generation and the generations to come. Lord, that the the decline would stop and you would start gathering a harvest in these next few years. The kind of thing that we wouldn't believe, even if people told us about it. Lord, we pray five years from now we'd be looking back and we would talk about the turning points that happened when God spoke to us and said, now is the time to build. Now is the time to plant. Now is the time to advance. So send us out, Lord, we pray. In the power of your Holy Spirit, let us live and work for your praise and glory. May your blessing rest upon us and rest upon your people. May your blessing rest upon our churches. May your blessing rest upon the regions and the areas that you've entrusted to us. Lord, we know that the fields are white for harvest, but you say, ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field. Lord, we pray that you would triple our number, Lord. Triple the amount of people who are used to extend the kingdom of God in the areas that we have entrusted to us. Lord, in our churches, Lord, would you multiply the amount of workers for the harvest fields? Would you provide the physical resources, the human resources, the financial resources we need that we are longing for and we are crying out for? And so would you bless us, Lord, and also bless your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.